We're excited you're here. Gretna Baptist Church exists to help people discover, grow, and model faith in Jesus Christ. Um, having said that, um, a few announcements before we get started this morning. It's great to have Carl Kirby with us this morning. Um, I'm not going to go into the whole long story of how he's here, but we were blessed to have him here nonetheless. We're excited that we're able to uh, to be able to be encouraged in the word and be challenged. Um, we appreciate that you're here to work. I know some of you are here for the first time because Carl is here, and we're so glad that you're here today. Uh, we exist, again, to help people discover, grow, and model faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, everything that we do, everything that we uh, seek to accomplish is for that purpose. And so we're excited that you're here to discover who Jesus Christ is today and maybe grow and model that faith. Sunday school is back. We're excited for that. We're back in person. Uh, we've got adjust, we've adjusted the class sizes a little bit to different rooms, but everything is uh, back in motion. The donuts are back, but we're serving rather than you grab them. So uh, a lot of the kids are excited about that. Um, we're the adult Sunday school. We're doing a study in Romans. So myself and um, Pat Phelan are kind of co-teaching that. It's more of a conversation of the Book of Romans rather than a monologue, so I trust that you'll come to that as adults and you'll appreciate that conversation. Also, we have uh, tonight an opportunity to canvas and prepare for our VBS this year, which is August, uh, what is it? Third through the eighth, okay? So we're gonna be canvassing for the next two weeks and we're not gonna really become in contact with people, we're just gonna kinda little, little, leave a little sticker on the door. Um, and uh, trust that you'll come back so we can hit all of our neighborhoods in the community and let them know about uh, uh, that opportunity. Also, if that's not enough to get you out, if reaching people for Christ is not enough, there will be ice cream, okay? Maybe that'll help. So come on out. We'll have ice cream here for you. Uh, also, campers leave uh, tomorrow, and for the next three weeks, we're going to have camp going on, junior, uh, senior high, junior high, and then senior saints. So... Uh, Mr. Kirby's going to be speaking for the next two weeks, and then I, I have to follow you. That's rough. So I do the Senior Saints week after uh, the uh, Junior High week is over. So just be pray for all of those who are heading off camp. Let's pray for safety. Let's pray for wisdom as uh, we minister there in Genoa, Nebraska. Also, encourage you to remember there, those who are serving as deacons, there's a deacons meeting this Tuesday at 630. Also, if you'd like to help serve coffee, sanitizing team, or if you'd like to be involved in the nursery ministry, there's a sign-up sheet in the foyer. You can do that so we can continue to serve others. And, of course, volunteers are always needed for VBS ministry, uh, Concrete and Cranes, uh, Philippians 1-6, and that's August 3rd through the 7th. Having said that, let's go ahead and stand together as we begin worship together. As we sing, This is Amazing Grace. for you this morning. All right, lift it up. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes an orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory. Who rules the nation with truth and justice and unlike the Son of all of his brilliance. The King of glory, the King of all kings. Amazing grace, this is a failing love, that you will take my place, that you will bear my cross, you will lay down your life, that I will be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. 
that was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. like a fount of blessings that just flow. Amen. Let's sing this beautiful old song. Come thou fount of every blessing. Come thou fount of every blessing. To my heart to sing thy grace. Sing the mercy never ceasing. All for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sun, some my flaming tongues above. Praise the name I'm fixed upon it, name of God's redeeming love. Hitherto thy love has blessed me, thou hast brought me to this place, and I know thy Safely home by thy good grace. Jesus saw me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, here to rest, to me from danger, called me with his precious blood. Oh, to praise how great a debtor, daily I let thy goodness, like a better, by my wandering heart to be. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts of love. Let's pray together. Father. How majestic is your name in all the earth. Father, your glory is above the heavens. Father, when we look at the night sky and see the work of your hands, the moon and the stars which have been set in place, your greatness overwhelms us. And Father, in our hearts, we feel so small and insignificant to your greatness. Father, you tell us that you have made us just a little lower than the angels and crowned us with glory and honor and made us rule over the works of your hands and have put everything under our feet. So, Father, creator of all things, you who have called me by name, I declare, declare to you today that we do not fear because we are with you. We have been redeemed by you. You are ours and we are yours. Father, your presence with us is such a blessing. Father, thank you for calling us out of the darkness into that wonderful light, the light of the Lord Jesus Christ. And because of that relationship, because of Christ, our heart today overflows with thanksgiving. For we remember when we were still dead in our sin and hopeless and despairing, but now you have rescued us from the dominion of darkness, and brought us into the kingdom of Jesus. And our sins have been forgiven. Our slate has been wiped clean. Oh God, today purify us. Show us truth that we would be found living 
in a world that is dying. Open the eyes of our heart ever wider today that we pray. Strengthen us in our inner man that we might press on towards you. Renew our passion and hunger for you. Help us to live as one who's been called out through the communion and hope of Jesus Christ. Father, today we confess our weakness and our need of you. In a difficult day, we ask you to help us to have the strength to remain steadfast and focused on you, the author and the finisher of our faith. Lord, help us be strong in our weaknesses, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. a wonderful thing, and it's offered to you freely because of Jesus Christ. If it's not yours, make it yours today. What grace is mine? Let's sing together. What grace is mine that he who dwells in endless light, the cold of night to find my wisdom soul, and from his scars for mercy that will that I might live and in his angel home. So I will go wherever he is calling me. I lose my life to find my life in him. I 
today from Reasons for Hope. Thank you for being here today. Well, good morning, everybody. Did you guys pay attention to the lyrics that you just sang? I didn't sing. I don't sing. <laughs> God, God says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. I make a painful noise unto the Lord. So, I'm always afraid this thing will go hot and you're out of here. So uh, um, so I will go wherever He is calling me. I lose my life to find my life in Him. I give my all to gain the hope that never dies. I bow my heart, take up my cross, and follow Him. Really? Really? Honestly? Amen? Good stuff? That doesn't sound like it. I'm sorry, we got a new bunch. Well, Sunday schoolers know me. I'm weird. Um, New folks, I'm weird. I'm Carl. Uh, interaction is a good thing for me, okay? Uh, so is that good stuff? Amen? Okay. Uh, what well, grace is mine to know his breath alive in me. Beneath his wings, my wakened soul may soar. All fear can flee, for death's dark night is overcome. My Savior lives and reigns forevermore. Good stuff? You know what? I am being really honest with you when I say, when I read these lyrics, I'm like, amen. But then I look at my life and say, but do I live these lyrics? I just find it easier to sing the lyrics than to live the lyrics. And so when I when I read something like this, like, man, this is really powerful. This is good stuff. And it's like, oh, God, help me to live that. And that's my prayer today is that we can live those lyrics because those are powerful. I, 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 I just found it really good as I was listening to that because, again, I really honestly don't sing. My voice is really weak. And so I try to protect it for yelling at kids this whole week. So I won't really yell, but I will yell. Um, but not in a mean yell, not in a mean yell, just passionate yell, okay? So how many, are, how many of you parents are sending kids out this week? How many are sending them out next week? Okay, so they'll be safe. I won't yell too much. Um, this morning, I want to really encourage you. I want to challenge you. Those of you that uh, uh, bless me by coming to Sunday school, thank you. I know that it's different, and Sunday school is just coming back, and things have been in turmoil, and so, uh, well... I'm, I'm looking forward to normal, to be honest with you, in a way. <laughs> so uh, I don't want to get back too normal. I don't want to get back too normal because too normal was when we were taking things for granted. You know what I mean? Here's something that I noticed. This, this, does this count towards my sermon time? Okay, good. All right, good. Um, here's one of the good things that I've noticed about the craziness. In my community, my neighborhood, I have seen more family units walking on the street than I have in the last 12 years that I've lived there. So there are some good things that are happening where maybe some priorities are being rearranged because, you know, I, I haven't been on the road. This is my first speaking engagement since October of last year. I was on the road 230 days, 236, I think it was last year. And then I haven't gone anywhere because of all the craziness that's gone on, plus some other things. My wife had a real health scare, and I had to I had to take December, January off, February off, and then this thing hit. But I'm telling you, 
that I have seen some really positive things too with families that are just like getting, it's almost like uh, whenever, when your computer's not working right, what do you do? You restart, you know? And I think we've had to reboot our families. And maybe some folks are seeing that, look, this is important. This time that I'm getting to spend with my family is really important. And I'm praying that we don't go back to taking that for granted in the future. So, uh, and taking church for granted. The fact that we can go to church. Don't take it for granted. This is a blessing, man. This is a blessing. I go for two weeks of camp here. I go to California. California has already said that uh, uh, can't do uh, camp. It was supposed to be a week-long camp. Can't do overnight camp. So Monday, Wednesday, Friday now, they're doing camp where the kids have to go home by midnight. Tuesday, Thursday, can't do anything, all right? Can't sing, because singers, you singers, you're super spreaders. So, look, you took for granted that you were able to sing that song. Don't. Don't. We are a blessed people. Don't give up our freedom so easily. So, uh, this morning I'm talking about whose voice are we listening to. It's going to be kind of a continuation of my Sunday school, kind of fleshing out what I was talking about in Sunday school. So, those of you that were here, it'll make a little more sense. Those of you that weren't here, you'll still get it, I'm sure, I hope. Um, anybody familiar with my little icon there? Anybody else familiar with that TV show? Okay, I like that show. I'm not going to lie. Uh, I like it. For those of you that aren't familiar with it, it's a singing show. And for whatever reason, a guy that can't sing likes good singing. I, I do. I genuinely like good singing. And so this program I liked, it kind of got me hooked because of the premise. When it first starts off, for those of you that don't know, you've got four judges, okay? You've got your four judges, and somebody comes out to sing, but those four judges have their back to the singer, okay? And so then the person sings, and then one of the four judges, or all the four, or any of them, they decide to turn around to try to get this person to join them on their team, okay? And then it's a team singing thing. And I like that because we live in a culture that is so superficial. We're so concerned about this. You know, and this one is just purely based on the voice. And I like that. So let me set this up. Uh, about four years ago now, uh, the four judges, they're, they're secular. Look, this is not a Christian show, okay? Show me some grace. It's not a Christian show, um, but they have four secular judges this year. This was the, these were the judges that year who are all quite talented. You know, even if I don't like their music, they're still very talented. And so... Uh, here we are, we're down to the final eight. I don't know how many they start off with. It's a bunch, all right? But now you're down to the final eight. When you get to the final eight, by this time, everybody has a good voice. Really, I mean, that many to get to this, they're good. Um, so now I believe song selection is just as important, if not more so, as voice quality. Because you can have a great voice, but if you choose a bad song, see ya gone. So imagine final eight, knowing that you got to get the audience, not a Christian program. You've got to get the audience that's watching you on TV. They have to vote for you. I want you to hear a song selection that this individual made. Audio? Should an old forget cross the end and shame How I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain So I will change Did it take some guts to go on this secular program, sing the old rugged cross, knowing you got to get this audience to vote for you, right? Take some guts? That was lame. Did it take some guts? Yes, I think it did. 
But this isn't the voice that I'm talking about. I'm talking about a different voice here. So let's jump into Scripture. John 10, 22 to 26. I'm going to do kind of like the CK version, Carl Kirby version. I'm going to go quick on this. Uh, at the time of the feast of the dedication took place in Jerusalem, it was winter, and Jesus was walking to the temple in the portico of Solomon. The Jews gathered around him and were saying to him, How long will you keep us in suspense if you are the Christ? Tell us plainly. I'm going to suggest to you that uh, I genuinely believe that very few people spoke more plainly than Jesus. I mean, you read his re writings. Yes, he used allegory. Yes, he used poetry, uh, of course. But he spoke plainly. And he had already spoken plainly on this issue, and I'll prove it to you, because watch what happens. Jesus answered them, I told you. Now, I was an air traffic controller for 24 and a half years, all right? The last eight and a half years of my career, I was at O'Hare, world's busiest at that time. And uh, so now you know why I talk so quickly, okay? Uh, and, and this is a Chicago attitude right here. This is truly a Chicago attitude. When I first moved to Chicago, I moved from Salt Lake City, Utah. And I'll never forget asking a guy a question. And the guy looks at me like, what, are you stupid? I told you. And it's just an attitude, a Chicago attitude. Now, I'm not saying that Jesus was from Chicago, but I just, I felt that, I just felt that attitude. I was like, I told you. And you do not believe the works that I do in my Father's name. These testify of me. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. So here's the first point I want to make to you this morning. It's not that we don't hear. All right? Jesus is speaking very clearly. Word of God is very clear. The problem is, is that we don't like what we hear. And I don't know about you. I just know me. I try to speak from first-hand experience because I figure if I'm struggling with something, if I'm doing something, some of you out there will get it. And this is me personally. When I don't like what I hear, I've got a couple of ways that I deal with it. Number one is I make excuses. I am a professional excuse maker. If there is something that you don't like about me, I am telling you right now, I will have a reason why I do it. And if I don't, I will come up with one quick. I'm a professional. Been doing it for years. So make excuses. Or, or another thing that I'll do is strike out in anger. Ever had that happen to you? You honestly talk to somebody because you genuinely care, and then they, you think you're better than me. Right? Yeah. I have that tendency. Uh, or we do nothing. Right? Or, or even worse, we hide. <laughs> you know, oh, I know it's coming. I'm out of here, right? These, these are the way that I deal with things that, that I don't like to hear. I don't know what your mechanism is, but I think most of us have one. You, you find yours. But watch what happens here. Jesus continues on, 27 to 30. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. By the way, I have to take a bunny trail here. ADD, oh yes, it's legit. It's a, it's a gift. <laughs> when you learn to harness it, I'm telling you, it's a gift. Squirrel, I mean, it is awesome, man. Now, you get sick of it after a while, but it's one of those really, no one will snatch them out of my hand. I want you to understand this. This is one of the greatest guarantees you can ever get. I, I don't know about you, but I remember when I was an air traffic controller and I bought a brand new car back when I could afford to do that kind of thing. And I bought the extended warranty. Bumper to bumper warranty. Yes. A week later, I got a flat tire. And I took that car back to the dealer. And I said, hey, I got a flat. I wanted to get you out to fix it. He looks at it and says, okay, that'll be 50 bucks, 100 bucks. I don't know. I can't remember what it was. And I said, oh, no, 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 no. I have the bumper to bumper warranty. And he said, uh, no, no. I said, no, no, look, you don't understand. I bought the extended warranty. It's bumper to bumper, covers everything. He said, no, you don't understand. The fine print says, we don't fix those kind of flats because that's a sidewall flat. We don't fix sidewall flats. We fix flats on the bottom of the tire. You got to, I'm like, see, this is the world. The world is always looking for loopholes to get out of something. I'll sell you this warranty, but brother, you better read that fine print because I'm finding a way to get out of it. That's not Jesus. No one, by the way, no one includes you. No one can take you out of my hand. You want a guarantee? You want a warranty? There it is, brother. You can take that one to the bank and you don't have to worry about somebody trying to manipulate you out of it. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Hello? Is that plain? 
Tell us plainly. We want to know. Is that plain? Pretty plain, right? So what was the response from the people? Thank you, Jesus. Man, we have really been wondering about this, and we so appreciate you just shooting us straight and telling us like it is. Thank you, right? You guys have read this. What do they do? They pick up rocks. They're going to kill them. And he's like, so what good work are you going to kill me for? And they're like, oh, no, no, no. We're not going to kill you because of a good work. We're going to kill you because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. Did he speak plainly? Yes. Did they understand? Yes, they didn't like what they heard. We have the same issue today in our world, right now. Whose voice are we listening to? I think this is something that I have to ask myself, because there's lots of voices speaking to us. As I said in the Sunday school, 400,000 churches across the nation of America, over 400,000 churches, and Christianity is invisible for the most part in our culture. How can that be? I'm going to suggest to you because we've got so many voices speaking at us that we've gotten confused many times. So let's identify some of the voices. It's the only way I know how to deal with things. The media, the internet. Is that a voice that's having an impact on a generation? Uh, a lot of the teens are not going to like me by the time I get done with this. Uh, a lot of the parents aren't going to like me. But you know what? I don't like giving this talk. So it's an issue we have to address. Reality. So, media, internet. Is it having an impact? I got a short video I'll show you. Time to get that multitask and 100 billion neuron connecting priority arranging segment of your wonderfully constructed brain to contemplate this. Ever wonder how many handshakes take place in a day? How many hugs happen? How many one-to-one -one face to face conversations go on? What about glances, kisses, laughs, and prayers? Ways we connect. And you, right there, right now. How are you connected to the person next to you? The people around you? Your friends, your enemies, the strange dude at the mall. How about the movies you watch, the books you read, the messages all around you? And how do you connect differently than people connected in the past? So many thoughts, ideas, blogs, texts, posts, and tweets these days. Everybody wants to connect to someone or something. And the world wide web of intersection and connection has changed everything. Get this. One out of eight couples married in the U.S. in 2008 met through social media. Unfortunately, half will be divorced in five years, connected and disconnected. There are over 500 million active Facebook users who spend over 700 billion minutes per month clicking, posting, uploading, and downloading. An average user is connected to 80 community pages, groups, and events, and each person creates 90 pieces of content each month. Folks got a lot to share, lots to say. So much that the average user spends 55 minutes per day, 6.5 hours per week, or about 1.3 full days per month on Facebook. And that's just people sitting around home because more than 200 million are on Facebook through mobile phones nowadays because long lost are the days of landline phones, busy tones, and yeah, David Jones. And speaking of cell phones, in 2004, 674 million were sold, which is 105 million less than the 779 million sold in 2005, which is nothing compared to the almost 4 billion sold in the last three years. Some people in the world who don't have toilets or houses have cell phones. People really want to connect. But wait, there's more. One trillion text messages were sent in 2008, 1.5 trillion in 2009, and then it went up to 6.1 trillion just recently. That's a thousand texts per person for every person on the planet. That's a lot of connecting. Yet this hasn't even scratched the surface. There's over 50 million tweets per day, over 60 million LinkedIn people, and 43 million people still visit MySpace per month. Then there's however many millions on Ning, Tag, Meetup, Bebo, My Yearbook, and Friendster looking at everything from posts to pics to video. Speaking of which, it would take you over 27 years without sleeping to watch all the videos uploaded on YouTube just this week. Everybody wants to connect. Connect with a friend, connect with family, connect to the past, connect to the future, connect to God. Connect with God. The one who created connections, voices, images, ears, eyes, smiles, kisses, glances, faces, friends, music, color, stars, electricity, light, laughter, and love, just to name a few. Connect with him? And what does that mean? Well, you connect the dots. So it's a voice. It's having a major impact. We need to address it. New York Times says that if your kids are awake, they're probably online. Those ages 8 to 18 spend seven and a half hours a day on their smart devices. By the way, that does not include the uh, hour and a half that they're texting or the half hour they're talking. If you combine it, because this younger generation, adults, is better at multitasking than my generation, okay? I'm multitasking right now because I'm walking and talking. That's multitasking for me. Younger generation is talking, texting, driving, and got a movie playing, all right, and, and got music at the same time. So if you add up all the hours, it's 11 hours of media a day. 
11 hours of media a day is what this younger generation is being exposed to. And you don't think it's a voice that's having an impact. Let me take you to Dr. Carolyn Leaf. I do not think that she is a Christian. I don't think, at least everything that I've seen. She could possibly be, but it's a secular uh, secular journal that I'm getting my information from. Uh, by the way, Sunday schoolers, you remember this. Uh, number two killer of teenage girls in America is suicide. Number one cause of suicide is depression, anxiety, and depression. Number one cause of anxiety and depression is stick with me. Teens are exposed to eight and a half hours on average of electronic media today. According to the archives of general psychiatry, this increased simultaneous exposure to electronic media during the teenage years is associated with an increase in depression and anxiety. Number one cause of anxiety and depression is the drug that we are putting in our children's hands. It's a reality. This is why I'm telling you the kids aren't going to like me. Because this is a drug, we are paying for it, and we are putting it into our children's hands, and it is having a major impact. Well, Carl, you got one. Yeah, I do. I do. And I got two iPads and uh, three laptops, and absolutely. But I understand the power that's in it, and I understand the impact. There's nothing that goes on here that my wife doesn't see. Period. Just the way it is. Anything comes in, she sees it. Anything goes out, she sees it. I'm sure there's workarounds, but I don't know what they are. It's like, it's the way it is. It's having an impact on this younger generation, parents. Norway, the Bergen Facebook addiction uh, scale was developed in response to research showing that addiction to social media is proving to cause the same damage in the brain as addiction to alcohol and cocaine and is as addictive as drugs, alcohol, and chemical substance abuse. It is a drug, and we are paying for it, and we are putting it into our children's hands, and it is having a major impact. I can hear some of the parents out here, you're already angry at me. Oh, but, 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 if I take it away, my child would be mad at me. That's your job. Parent, it's your job. You've got to make the kids mad at you. That's what we're here for. That's our goal in life. <laughs> no, our goal in life is to protect them. And if this is a drug that's having an impact, hey, if you take cocaine away from a cocaine addict, you think they're going to thank you. No, it is a drug. This isn't Carl Kirby speaking. This is the secular research. How much is too much? Gene Twinge is the head of the psychiatry, uh, psychology department at San Diego State University. If you want to read a very interesting book, research it was done, it's a 22-word title, but just look up iGen, like iPad, I-G-E-N, iGen, Twinge, last name is her last name. It's, it's, the research that she did is it's just fascinating to me. So how much is too much? At what point are these devices starting to have an impact, okay? Not me, secular research. Three hours of screen time a day increases the chance that a teen will be at risk for committing suicide. Three hours. And what's the average time they're spending? Double that, double that, okay? Now, if there's a young person in here, well, I don't have a smartphone, this is why. This is why. You have a parent that cares enough about you that they're like, I don't want you exposed to this stuff. I don't want you to be impacted by this. This isn't mean-spirited. This is a parent who loves you enough that they're going to make a tough call and catch some flack from the culture. How about this? She continues on. Rates of teen depression and suicide have skyrocketed since 2011. When all this stuff blew up. It's not an exaggeration to describe iGen as being on the brink of the worst mental health crisis in decades. Much of this deterioration can be traced to their phones. There is compelling evidence that the devices we placed in young people's hands are having profound effects on their lives and making them seriously unhappy. One of the ironies of iGen life is that despite spending far more time under the same roof as their parents, today's teens can hardly be said to be closer to their mothers and fathers than their predecessors were. Quote, I've seen my family, or I'm sorry, I've seen my friends with their families and they don't talk to them, unquote, Athena told me. Quote, they just say, okay, okay, whatever, while they're on their phones, they don't pay attention to their family, unquote. Like her peers, Athena is an expert at tuning out her parents so she can focus on her phone. Ever experienced it? Ever seen it? Walked into a restaurant back when it was okay to do that sort of a thing and see a table of four and every one of them got a device stuck in their face and not a one of them talking to each other. Ever see it? Ever experience it? It's having an impact, guys. Teens who spend more time than average on screen activities are more likely to be unhappy, and those who spend more time 
than average on non-screen activities are more likely to be happy. There's not a single exception. Listen to this quote here. If you were going to give advice for a happy adolescent based on this survey, it would be straightforward. Put down the phone, turn off the laptop, and do something, anything that does not involve a screen. If you have a child that's suffering from anxiety and depression, may I encourage you to at least consider if they got their face stuck in this thing, you start here. Is there a place for medication? Absolutely. Absolutely. I have family members who have to deal with issues and have to take medication for it. I am not remove all that. The doctors are bad. No. There are biological issues. Sin has destroyed the world. Things have happened to us. But I'm going to say to you, I believe that the majority of what we're seeing going on with this mental and anxiety is right here. It's self-imposed. Because when you spend 11 hours watching the mess that's coming at this generation, who could be normal, even close to normal? I can't even watch news anymore. I, I'm, I mean, I watch The Voice. I mean, that's about it, man. I can't handle it. It's just all this mess. And if you just suck that in, it's going to have an impact. So there's not a parent in this room, I don't believe, or a grandparent in this room that would allow their child to walk into their room, lock the door, spend the night with a stranger. Really? We do it every day. We walk into the room, lock the door, take one of these things with them. It's reality. You don't know who's in there with them. Here's some more stuff. Just to, just to throw it out there. Stats on teens using social media apps. Average age of kids found involved in pornography on social media. You want to guess? You really don't want to guess. 11 years old. The percentage of kids in the age range of ages 8 to 18 involved in this stuff. 70 percent. Guys, this is, this is horrendous. The percentage of kids sending pictures to anonymous people, 11 percent. I hesitate to keep going on, guys. You know what I'm saying to you? This is real. And, 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 and hiding from it isn't the answer. I, I'm This is an actual sign, all right? Monitor children's activity on these popular social media apps again. These are all apps that the government is telling you that is being used to draw your child into improper relationships. And some of those are just, these are normal. They're games. It's a game. What? Minecraft? Fortnite? Look, unless you're taking precautions, they are tools that are being used to reach a generation. So what do we do? Well, here's, here's a tool. I'm going to give you some tools. And, and by the way, I don't get a cut of any of these tools, so it's not like I'm making these recommendations so I can get a percentage of your sales. I don't. Bark. 5.1 million children protected. 16 school shootings prevented. 30,000 severe self-harm situations detected. It's $9 a month for the whole family. Cancel whenever. No contract. Something to take a look at. All right? Um, uh, covenant eyes. Covenant eyes. I, I sat through a presentation with the vice president there. I think they've got a great tool there. All right? Um, circle. Disney actually does something that's worth something. This circle thing is like everybody, every computer, every smart device in your home goes through yours, and you have the power. You know where everybody is. You know where what time they're spending. And by the way, you can say, all right, yes, you get... Uh, you get internet time this week. It's between uh, 6 and 6.05 in the morning. And <laughs> done. And by the way, if I don't check this box because you did what you were supposed to do as far as the chores are concerned, you don't even get that. You control it. And there's no workarounds. The one, the one, there's some problems with this one because if they try to work around, then it shuts your whole system down. So you might be out and you're like, uh-oh, my phone doesn't work. Yeah, somebody was trying to work around. All right? It's a tool. It's just something to go. And if you're a travel person, circle go. Like me, I could have it here on my phone, know exactly what's going on in my home, tells me everything individual, the whole works. 
And so uh, I'd encourage you that. And then I found this one because all the smartphones, they got to have a smartphone. Everybody's got to have a smartphone. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce this. Custodio, it's a free version. So, hey, we, we don't have finances. We can't, this is a free version of a software that helps you with that stuff. If you really want to go all out, two-way walkie-talkie, man. It's like, you ain't calling nobody but me, bro. You hit this, you get me. That's it, done, all right? Now, that's a little extreme, I admit. And so some people might be, like, really uh, protesting against that. So I found this. I saw this commercial, and I got to share it with you because I don't have it. But if I, had a, if I had a teenager today, I would absolutely consider it because of the commercial alone. It's that good. So I'm going to show you the commercial. Oh. Hey, I wasn't ready. That's what I said about parenting. <laughs> My son assures me he's the last kid on earth without a smartphone. I know, I'm a terrible mom. Can I please have a phone? Yes, Kevin, nagging really worked this time. Really? Uh-huh. <sighs> ring, ring. Hello? Oh, it's for you, Kevin. Let's face it, our kids don't have great options when it comes to getting their first phone. Flip phones are cool, and smartphones aren't safe. I'm not about to give my 12-year-old full access to the internet, and I'm not about to give the creeps on the internet full access to my 12-year-old. Our kids need a phone that they'll love that's also completely safe. Introducing Gab Wireless, where you can finally get safe phones for kids. This smartphone has everything. This Gab phone has everything a kid needs. No social media, no games, no internet, no sending or receiving pictures of anything, no problems. The Gab phone looks like a smartphone, so kids feel comfortable using it in public, but it's completely safe, so parents feel at ease giving it to them. The Gab phone has talk, text, calculator, alarm, calendar, radio, and that's it. They're kids, geez, what more do they need? And the best part? The average Gab phone user spends 80% less time on their phones than the average teen. What are they gonna do, calculate? <laughs> Nerds. That means your kids will be living life beyond the screen, spending more time playing outside, developing talents, and learning how to talk to actual humans. And who knows, maybe you'll have more spontaneous family pillow fights. Hey, I wasn't ready. That's what I said about parenting. You okay? He's okay. Fine. Gab is the easiest phone in the world to set up. First step, order your Gab phone online. Second step, there is oh, no anyway. second step. I lied. <laughs> it comes set up. There you go. You get the idea. I love the commercial. Um, they get a smartphone, but it's safe. So they don't feel like a goof because they're using. So it's an idea. I just want to give you some tools that you could possibly use. So Paris, what can you do? Number one, you have to do this. You have to monitor social media activities of your children. You have to do this. There's no question on this anymore. It's just become such a dangerous area. Fight to require social media dating apps to strictly prohibit teens under the age of 18. Parents need to get involved with this. You know, we, we need to say, look, under 18 shouldn't have access to these things. It's just, no. Reduce the use of smartphones of your children by attracting them to healthy activities. Gab wireless, there you go. But more importantly, come on, do something. Uh, only allow your children to use the phone computer while in your presence. I'm going to tell you right now, any phone, I don't care if it was flipped, but as a matter of fact, if I had children today, they would have a phone that was so dumb, I mean, serious dumb, they wouldn't even be able to text on it because, quite frankly, I want them to learn how to speak. And texting, writing, R has an A and an E, okay? I don't know where, but it's in there. And U has a Y-O. And they're going to learn how to spell. You're going to learn how to talk to people. And when you come in the house, that, that thing is going over here, and it is not going anywhere else with you. That's just the rules. That's I, I'm my house. I'm protecting you. I don't you want to talk? Call through the landline. Oh, we don't have one. Okay, give them my number. Then call through me, and I'll see if I'll give it to you. Utilize spying apps. Ooh, I need to spy on my children. Yeah. My daughter, I'll never forget. I told you senior year. She wasn't like crazy wild child. She really wasn't. She really wasn't. I don't want to make it sound like that. But we just had differences of opinion on freedom level. And so uh, I'll never forget. It's like, she's like, um, oh, man, I got to be careful. <laughs> Let's just put it like this. I knew where she was. I knew what was going on. I knew her friends, and I knew all that stuff. And she didn't appreciate it. She got so frustrated with me that uh, we were having one of our conversations, and she looks at me, and she goes, Dad! 24-7. You want to be around us 24-7. And I was like, yeah? What's your point? 
But you see, you've got to understand that I didn't get saved. I didn't become a Christian until she was five years old. And the reason that I had gone to that extreme is because after I got saved, I'm 26, she's uh, five, and I look on my dresser as I was getting ready to go to work one day, and I saw this picture of my daughter sitting on my lap outside of an amusement park, and we lived in Salt Lake City. What a great picture. Dad, loving dad, taking his children to the amusement park. Great picture. No. Because that picture was taken before I was a Christian, and I remembered when I saw that. First time I saw it was spiritualized, and I remember exactly what I was thinking. I was saying, this kid is heavy. I wish she would get off of me. And I remember taking my arm and sliding it in between her back and my stomach so the pressure in my forearm got her out of my lap. And I'm telling you right now, I broke when I saw that picture at age 26 as a Christian. I broke. You get one shot with your child, and that's where I was. That's who I was apart from Christ, yes. So when she said 24-7, you want to be around us 24-7? Amen, because that's what Jesus Christ does, man. To go from this kid is heavy, get off of me, to 24-7. These devices, if I got to use a spying app to know what's going on in my child's life, you better believe it. I will do it in a heartbeat. Install software to block the phones from apps and those sorts of things. Look, do something. These are just ideas, but you got to do something. It's a voice. TV, I told you how many hours of watching TV, 1,064. Average American watches more than five hours of television a day. What are we watching? Interesting, interesting. Uh, did some research last year. Top watch shows, all right? Game of Thrones. Now, uh, I'm going to be honest with you. I've never seen a full episode of it. I really haven't. But I saw some headlines. I guess the show finished last year, and there was some major controversy on the show the last year. Major controversy. Watch this. Um, they had a coffee cup in one of the scenes. All right? This is ancient time, and they had a coffee cup in there. People were freaking out. It was headline news. Coffee cup. Game of Thrones. They went back and spent a lot of money to vid uh, digitally edit out the coffee cup. All right, but then in the same season, the last season, a plastic water bottle. They had a plastic water bottle in one of the scenes. They didn't have plastic water bottles back when they were Vikings raiding the whole continent. People freaking out. The news headlines. Where are you going with this, Carl? I told you, ADD. It's a gift. There is a purpose. I'm watching the headlines, never seen an episode of the show, but I made a decision not to watch any of it before this ever came out because of one thing. When it started getting really popular, I had young people talking to me. I had, um, I had a, a youth leader one night come up to me and say, yeah, man, I feel embarrassed because you gave that talk this morning and I was going to skip church because they, they were going to show that tonight and I, I was going to skip church so I could go watch that instead of coming back tonight. All right. Game of Thrones. Why didn't I ever watch an episode? Because when I did research on it, because all these people were telling me about it, this is what I read from a secular source. Rape has become so pervasive in the drama that it is almost background noise, a routine, and unshocking occurrence. Now, help me out. This is what doesn't connect with this poor pea brain here. I'm going to freak out because there's a plastic water bottle or a coffee cup in a sink. Headlines. Major news. But abuse of women is commonplace, background noise, normalizing, and nobody's freaking out? No, I'm not going to let that stuff in my heart. I'm not going to let it in my mind, because once it's in, it's in. No, I don't understand this. We're so willing to fight over a coffee cup or a plastic water bottle, but an act that should just anger us. Ah, good storyline. Interesting characters. Sorry, man. And there's shows that I can't even show you that are coming out right now. All, all I can put it to you is like this. Matthew 6. The eye is the lamp of the body, so if your eye is healthy, your bo whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. Look, what you let in is going to work its way out. That's reality. It's reality. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. When somebody is spending 11 hours a day with something, that is the company that they're keeping. So, as a parent, guess what? I need to be aware of what those 11 hours they are spending with 
who they are, what impact they're having. Psalm 101.3, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. The stuff that I see, a lot of it's wicked. Be careful. Games, I told you we'd touch on games. Ooh, -wee. now I really get to turn the uh, certain individuals off. By the way, gaming isn't just for kids anymore. Do you understand that uh, this more mature generation is crushing a lot of candy? <laughs> a lot of gaming going on with the mature generation, all right? So it's not just about younger generation anymore. It's a, it's a, it's a voice. So uh, what do we have here? I told you very briefly on the video game stuff. How is God, Jesus, Christian's Bible depicted in top-selling video games? Well, one of those is a game called Assassin's Creed, and there's a bunch of different versions of it. And in one of the side ex, uh, ex issue, I, I don't know what to call it, side adventures you could do, you get to find out that Jesus didn't die on the cross. Oh, Jesus didn't die on the cross. I mean, it's everything. Scripture, offering the drink, and the stab in the side. But the assassins come in and pull them off the cross. So Jesus didn't die on the cross. No, no, no. By the way, I have read the reports of schools saying, we need to get our kids to play these games because it gets them interested in history. Yeah, fake history. There's another one uh, where you get to play in Assassin's Creed Syndicate where you get to be poor old Charles Darwin. you got to save old poor Charles Darwin. Those mean old Christians. Christians are chasing him all over town. They're going to kill him. The Christians are trying to kill Charles Darwin because his teachings are going to destroy the moral fabric of the culture, which I, I agree <laughs> I agree with. But I'm not about trying to kill him. I mean, these Christians are so bad, they're killing the newsboys. And I'm not talking about the band. I'm talking about the little boys that sell newspapers on the street corners because those, those newspapers had evolution in it. So the Christians were killing the little boys selling newspapers. Yeah, that's Christianity. That's uh, yeah. And forget about Grand Theft Auto. We're not we're not even going to go there. Uh, there's only been 80 million copies sold and three billion dollars made. So you know, there's no impact there at all. And it's not in the church, of course not. Are you kidding me? And Walking Dead. Oh, we didn't even go there. We don't have to watch it. We can play it. How about this one? Anybody know what this one is? My daughter is a public school teacher. Okay, and she brought this one to me. Kids in her class bringing in these plush dolls and the backpacks and all that sort of a thing. Anybody know what this is? Five Nights at Freddy's, right? It's a video game. Let me read you what this is. Elementary school. The main antagonist of the series is William Afton, the co-founder owner of Fazbear Entertainment, as well as the CEO of Afton Robotics, LLC. The company behind Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, he is a serial killer who murdered several children whose spirits now inhabit the animatronics. In the third game, it is revealed that he returned to Freddy Fazbear's Pizza after it closed down to dismantle the animatronics. This supposedly released the spirits of the children he murdered, scaring him into hiding inside a Springlock suit, suit where he was crushed to death and he became Five Nights at Freddy's main antagonist, Springtrap. Yeah, this is what I want my kids, elementary kids, playing and wearing backpacks and the toys. Guys, I had no clue about this. I, I, just, I saw that backpack. I saw the bears. Like, okay, whatever. By the way, just came out this year. Video game addiction is now officially a mental health disorder. Even though we're getting out of the WHO, they admitted it. Guys, it's a voice. My son came to me about three years ago, and he said, Dad, I got rid of cable TV. What? He was 34, right? Yeah, 30. Yeah, 34. 34? You're getting rid of cable TV? Did I have to tell my son to get rid of cable TV? No, he's 34. I said, why? He said, Dad, I took a sheet of paper. Parents, you want to do something? Have your children do it, but you do it with them. He said, I took a sheet of paper. I drew a line at the top, line down the middle, left side time spent glorifying God, right side time spent in the world. He said, for one week, I tracked how much time I spent in prayer, how much time I spent reading the Word of God, how much time I do, you know, worshiping God, all those things, all my Christian stuff. And then on the other side, I tracked. He said, I'm so proud of myself, Dad. I prayed for an hour one week. I read the scripture for an hour and a half one week, and I was so proud until I looked at the other side. He said, I got a problem with TV. So it's gone. 
didn't have to tell my son to get rid of it. By the way, I did the same thing. Guess what? When I'm out on the road, TV does not come on in the room when I'm in a hotel. Not because I was watching inappropriate stuff, but because I look at the hours. I'm like, are you kidding me? I'm spending this many hours here when I could be doing something that's going to have an impact? Do it. Do it with your child. Do it for two days. If you don't want to do it for a week, do it for two days. See what happens. Here's another voice. Here's a voice. Here's a good voice. Uh, the news, right? News is a good voice. Whew. You guys remember Dear Abby? we got some mature folks in here. Remember Dear Abby? England has a version of Dear Abby. Her name is called Agony Aunt because she can feel our pain. She's our auntie, right? And so uh, I want you to hear uh, the British version of, uh, of uh, th th those of you that aren't familiar with uh, Dear Abby. She was uh, someone that you wrote and she gave you wisdom, right? Gave you some real good advice. Here's the question that was posed to Agony Aunt. Can a mother love their child so much that she chooses to abort them rather than to give birth? Okay? So can a mother love their child so much? Here we go. True, no, and I think that um, if I were a mother of a, a suffering child, I would be the first to want, I mean, a deeply suffering child, I would be the first to want to put a pillow well, over its face. I... Okay, hold up, hold up, hold up. Can a mother love their child so much that they decide to abort it rather than to keep it? And the response is, if I had a deeply suffering child, pass the pillow. What? There's more. Um, as I would with a, you know, any suffering thing. And I think the difference is that my uh, uh, feeling of, of horror, suffering, is much greater than my feeling of uh, getting rid of a couple of cells. Nine hundred hours a year, our children get taught that we're nothing more than a couple of cells. Right? There is no God. Life is random chance processes. Given enough time, right circumstances, chemicals just came together. That's why we're here. Therefore, there is no purpose. There is no plan. Um. And we're surprised. Look, if there is no God, then why is what she's saying wrong? She's absolutely consistent with her worldview. This is why we have to deal with this worldview. I hope we don't have any good mothers in here today by her definition. Take a listen. Um, I, I'm sorry, I was just about to introduce another guest there, but that was a, that's a pretty horrifying thing would. to say, that you would put a pillow over a... Of course I would, if it was child. a child I really loved who was in agony. I, I think any good mother would. I had the blessing to take a group through Israel, and uh, we went through the Holocaust Museum, and I saw this sign at the Holocaust Museum, and it really struck me. It says, a country is not just what it does, it is also what it puts up with, what it tolerates, and we've tolerated far too long. A culture, godless culture, teaching our children that they're nothing more than a mistake at best. Naturalistic process. Here's a voice, the family. Come on, Carl. Man, you're beating us up. Lighten up, dude. Well, American Family, in crisis research by the Southern Baptist Council on Family Life, uncovered some disturbing facts. The majority of children in America have fewer than 10 minutes of significant, meaningful conversation with their parents each week. 900 hours in school, 1,064 TV, 936 video games. We're not talking about movies. And we're going to overcome that with fewer than 10 minutes of significant, meaningful conversation with our children each week. By the way, let me finish the quote. If you remove the mother, you can measure this, 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 Check on it. Ladies, you need to forgive me for one second. Gentlemen, we are one of the major problems in what's going on in our culture right now. It's our job to lo love our wives as Christ loved the church, willing to die for them. It's our job to raise our children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. When we abdicate our responsibility to anybody, government, church, mom, it's going to make everybody mad. When we abdicate our responsibility to anybody and we remove ourselves from that process and we're not engaged in that process, you're not going to like the outcome. God designed it to be a very specific way. We've got to get engaged. And I don't care if you public school, private school, homeschool, 
Whichever one you choose, whichever one the Lord is putting in your heart and driving you to, you need to be engaged with your child, period. We need to be involved. Ladies, you can listen again. So what do we do? Ah, This is heavy. This is no fun. I agree. We wake up and realize that there's a problem. We don't run and hide. That's not what we're called to do. We listen to the correct voice. And you know where I'm going with this, okay? We listen to the right voice, and that is the Word of God. But if you can't trust the Word of God, you're not going to listen to it. And we have a generation that's been trained and taught that, oh, the Bible's full of errors and mistakes. It's, uh, you can't trust it. Have any of you ever heard that claim? Anybody? Anybody? Well, for time, I'm not going to show you the debunked video, but I will tell you. Those of you that were in Sunday school, when you did that download thing, this is one of the debunks that you're going to get. If you're somebody that didn't see the debunked video in the first, or fast-paced animated, there are tools that I want you to have. All you have to do is on your smart device, text Adios Gretna to 51555, and you'll get that video as well as a bunch of others free of charge. Because in my humble opinion, one of the greatest gifts that we can give to anybody, including our children, is confidence. Confidence in the Word of God that it is real and trustworthy and deals with real issues. And that's going to be my goal over the next two weeks with those of you that raised your hands that are sending children out to that camp. That's going to be my goal. How do we break down the stereotypes? How do we break down whatever strongholds have been built up to keep them from trusting the Word of God? Let's deal with it. I covet your prayers. Luke 24. I love this. And they, behold, two of them went out the same day to the village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about three. Let me just do it like this. You got the guys. They're walking. They're on the road to Emmaus. And Jesus comes up to them because they're talking to each other. And they're, they're confused. It's like, we don't understand. We thought he was the guy. He's not the guy. They're talking, right? Jesus comes up to him, and he starts talking to him, and he asks him, so what are you all talking about? And this is the CKV, okay? And Cleopas said unto him, it's like, what? Are you new or something? That's the Chicago version. Are you new or something? Don't you understand? We thought he was the guy. He's not the guy. And so they're like, we don't understand these things. And so what did Jesus do? What did Jesus do? Because, look, as a Christian, what that means is I am a Christ follower. That's what Christian means. Not that you sit in a pew or a chair, sorry, pat a chair. Not that you come here and do this three times a week, four times a week, all right? Christ follower. I'm supposed to be a direct reflection of my Messiah, my rabbi. Watch what he does when questioned. We don't get it. We don't understand. Watch what he does. Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken, ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory. And then he goes, And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them and all the scriptures of things concerning himself. So what did Jesus do when everything was crazy? You can't come to church. We don't understand this. The haters are over here. The protests are over here. What do we do? What did Jesus do? He took them back to the beginning. He took them back to Genesis and said, look, if you want to understand why it's nuts, let me tell you why it's that way. you got to understand how it got to where it is today. And he started from there and built that foundation. And that's what we need to do. You start using the proper authority, listen to the proper voice to deal with these issues. So it depends on the voice you're listening to. Remember the beginning? Craig Wayne Boyd, final eight, sings the old rugged cross. Guess what? He got voted through to the final four. He ended up winning the entire season. But I didn't care about any of that. What I cared about is understand the show, those of you that aren't familiar. After the singer sings, the four judges, they give them an opportunity to give them feedback or ask a question or something like this, right? After he got done singing the old rugged cross, one of the judges, a guy named Pharrell Williams, who is, I'm not attacking him, he's not a Christian. He, by his own admission, he wrote, he was raised in the church, he no longer believes it, he's a universalist. This is him, not me, attacking. Pharrell Williams asked him a question. Take a listen. Uh, let's start with Pharrell, what'd you think? Man, Craig, I get it, man. To God be the glory. I just... <laughs> Amen. Going through, going through everything that you've gone through to get, your, get yourself here at this place, I have a question for you. What does it feel like to be at the top of your game and to surrender it to God in front of the whole entire world and sing? 
I got to be honest. When that was asked, my wife and I were like, look at each other like, did you hear that? Let me ask you, is that a silver platter to preach the gospel on national television, secular program? Is that a silver platter? Come on, I got to wake you up or you're going to drive out of here, get in an accident, and they're going to hold me a fault. Wake up. Is that a silver platter? By the way, we know that he did not get himself there. We know that. We know that, okay? Would you like to see the way that he responded? You're still asleep. Would you like to see the way that he responded? I'm not going to show you. Nope. Nope. I'm not going to do it. I couldn't even if I wanted to because I didn't put the clip in here for a very specific reason. It doesn't matter how he responded. Here's what matters. I told you, I speak personal. Carl, are you living your life in such a way that the lost would even think to ask you that question? Or have you gotten so good that you are blending in, made it through another day, whew, nobody found out I'm a Christian? Yes. 24 and a half years I worked for the federal government. Sometimes I did good, failed a lot too. This is the question that I ask myself. Am I living my life in such a way that the lost would even consider asking me that question? I give that to you. But I do want to show you somebody that did answer a question. Benjamin Watson, NFL player, football player. He's on CNN. This is back when Ferguson was going on, right? Ferguson and all the rioting and everything. What do we do? What do we do? You got the black, white, you're fighting and all this. What do we do? And I want you to hear a man that did answer. How can we, you know, black, white, whatever, improve this? Well, I, I, honestly, I think I, I point to it in the very last paragraph that I read. And, and I'm encouraged because things aren't the way they used to be. You know, we all have grandparents that, that told us how things were. We've all seen documentaries. We are definitely making progress. But I think on an individual, on a, uh, on a micro level, the issue is not really skin. The issue is sin. And I, I firmly believe that the issue is that internally we are flawed. Internally, we need salvation from our sin. Internally, our sin makes us prideful. It makes us judgmental. It makes us prejudiced, which leads to racism. It makes us lash out at people that don't look like us. It makes us look past, look past evidence to protect people that look like us. It, it makes us do all those things. It makes us lash out in anger. It makes us point finger. It, 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 it wow. makes us, our sin that's in us makes us do those things. And the only, the only salvation for this sin is the gospel. The only way to really cure that was on the inside is understanding that Jesus Christ died for our sins. And so th to me, on a micro level, it's understanding. It. Oh, and just like that, we lost him. I know I heard you guys rapping me. I just couldn't let him go. Benjamin Watson, thank you so much. Good luck at the game Sunday. I'm Brooke Baldwin. See you Monday. Jim Shudo, up next. Man, I hate it when that happens. I mean, <laughs> just like that, we lost him. Look, guys, I don't know where you are. I don't know who you work for. I don't, but I know who you work for, ultimately. 24 and a half years, federal government, I got threatened multiple times, we can fire you for proselytizing. Young folks, proselytizing means nothing more than you're, gonna, you're talking about Jesus. We can fire you for proselytizing. Me, hardhead? So you come in here and talk about whatever, whoever you're doing, whatever with, but if I come in here and talk about what Jesus is doing in my life, you can fire me? Yes. Let me put it to you like this. If God wants me here, there's not a thing you can do to get me out. If God doesn't want me here, there's not a thing I can do to stay. So do what you got to do, because I got to do what I got to do. Guys, I, th I just think we need some bold witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ. I think we need guys that are going to be cut off. And guess what? When they cut you off, they're not cutting you off. They're cutting him off. When they mock you, they're not mocking you. They're mocking him. They're not ridiculing you. They're really ridiculing him who sent you. Do not worry what the world thinks about you. Worry what he thinks about you. This is what I want to pass on to this younger generation. We need a generation of boldness. Please pray for us as we take that bus trip and train a thousand people to get out and just engage people. Not belligerent, not ignorant. We will not fight. We will not argue. I won't do it. But I will challenge people to think. 
Lord, I give it to you. You call us to be a light on a hill and to not be covered up with a basket. So God, don't let us be covered up. Help us to shine to a culture that needs to know you. We thank you for what you're going to do through simple obedience. We have nothing that's worth anything apart from you, Lord. So please help us to be obedient to you and use it. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. And together as we sing, change my heart, O oh God. Man, had a lot, of, a lot of things to think about today. He's, he's hit on the way you live your life. And uh, the way we live our life affects our heart, right? So let's look within as we sing this song. Change my heart, oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God, may I be like you. You are the potter, I am the clay. Hold me. God has placed the challenge upon your heart today. I encourage you to take action upon that. You want to need to speak with someone, please stick around. We'd be glad to talk with you after the service. This time we're going to have our offering. We're not going to collect the offering, but there's an offering box in the back. If you'd like to give, uh, you can place that offering in the box. If you'd like to give for Reasons of Hope Ministries, you can designate that gift for Reasons of Hope Ministries and put it on that offering envelope that's in the back and put it in that box, and we'll make sure it gets directed toward... Um, toward their ministry. Having said that, let's go ahead and pray as we take this offering. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to come to this place and have our hearts challenged about the way we live our lives outside of these four walls. Father, what we do inside of these four walls are important, but it's important because it's only a preparation for what we do outside of these four walls. Lord, you've challenged us today. You've pressed against our culture you pressed against us and made us a little uncomfortable in some ways. So, Father, I pray that as we would live our lives as we have just been singing this song, that we would allow our lives to be clay, that we would allow you to mold us and make us after your will. Father, I pray that as we take this offering today, that we would use it for your honor and your glory, that we would be stewards of it, that others will come to know you through Jesus Christ as a result of how we use these funds this day. Father, we thank you so much for Jesus Christ, the hope of our salvation. Amen. We're going to go ahead and sing our last song, I'm Forever Grateful. You did not wait for me to draw joy into you, but though yourself would fail humanity, you did not wait for me to cry out to to hear your voice calling me, and I'm forever grateful to you. I'm forever grateful for the cross. I'm forever grateful to you that you
cry out to you, but let me hear your voice calling me, and I'm forever grateful to you. I'm forever grateful for the cross. I'm forever That you came to seek and save the law, and I'm forever grateful to you. And I'm forever grateful for the cross, I'm forever grateful to you. That you came to seek and save. 